And I'm just really pleased to be here. As Nate said, I, uh, I did my postdoctoral fellowship here at uh, CIRA and really had a great experience working with Nate um, and other investigators here. And I still have uh, really important collaborations with uh, the investigators here, including Nate. Um, so it's been a, a, a great experience for me and a great launching point for my career. Uh, and as Nate told you, um, I had a small development or pilot grant uh, as a part of my fellowship that actually allowed me to get um, the grant that I'm, or, or the grant that I will discuss findings from uh, today. Uh, not so much related to the specific pilot I did, which I, I still do that type of research, which is uh, looking at daily diaries, but uh, focused on um, some of the other data that I collected through this, uh, this project. So. Uh, the title of the talk that uh, I'd like to give today is Trauma, Resilience, and HIV Vulnerability Among Young Black Men Who Have Sex With Men. And um, what I'll do is first uh, tell you a little bit about myself and um, the work I do. I, I like to sometimes just give a little background that I hope gives some context to uh, why I look at what I look at and, and sort of my organizing frameworks uh, that sort of guide the work that I'm doing. So I uh, am broadly interested in the intersecting roles that psychological factors and social contextual factors play in explaining HIV risk and vulnerability among ethnic minority men who have sex with men, or MSM, the uh, acronym you'll hear me use a lot during this talk. Uh, I'm also interested in situational factors that promote or prevent sexual risk-taking behavior, substance use, poor mental health and engagement and care among MSM, and have been doing a lot of work in the last five to seven years on interventions and specifically the development, um, implementation, and evaluation of secondary prevention interventions, primarily focused on um, HIV positive MSM as well as adolescent populations. So when I um, gave actually my first job talk, I used this model and I still go back to it. It's still a useful heuristic for me in terms of just the broad framework uh, that, again, organizes a lot of my ideas and, and so the work I do. And it's really, I'm interested in context, process, and outcome. Um, most of my outcomes are, are health-focused, uh, whether it be HIV or mental health, uh, which puts me in a school of public health. But I'm also interested in sort of the psychological processes that connect social contextual factors to the health outcomes that um, I'm interested in and that we look at um, uh, within psychology and public health. So contextual factors include communities that we belong to. I've done um, a lot of work looking at religious institutions. Um, uh, some of what I'll talk to you about today has to do with traumatic life experiences. And through the diary work that I do, I look at sexual situations. And some of the more psychological variables that I'm interested in understanding um, uh, potentially as, as mediators or moderators of the relationship between context and outcome are things like individual and collective efficacy, uh, self-regulation, resilience, something that um, I'll talk to you about uh, today that I also feel like is a somewhat problematic construct in a good way, but uh, it's nonetheless problematic, and psychological distress. And um, the outcomes I'm most interested in, of course, have to do with HIV, so condom use, substance use, but also for people living with HIV, um, engagement in care, and more specifically, adherence to antiretroviral medications, which are uh, increasingly important, not just for the treatment of disease, but also the prevention of uh, transmission to uninfected others. So before I talk to you about the specifics to uh, my study and the project, that um, uh, I did over the last couple of years, I wanted to just give a broad overview of some of the epidemiological data for HIV among black men who have sex with men uh, here in the United States. Um, and I know a lot of you will uh, be aware of some of this stuff, and some of you may not, uh, but I, I like to just provide some type of context to why this is important, why look at HIV um, for black men who have sex with men. And I really like this piece by, um, one of my colleagues actually at Columbia, Wafa El Sadr, and her colleagues published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 this really interesting um, uh, article that sort of compared uh, HIV prevalence and incidence in Sub-Saharan Africa with um, 
uh, incidence and prevalence rates here in the United States, but really focusing on specific subpopulations and areas of the country. And uh, those of you who know Wafa know that she directs uh, ICAP, the International Center for AIDS Prevention Studies at um, Columbia, and it's mostly global work that she's doing. Uh, but this was a piece that she titled the sort of, I believe it's the lost uh, and forgotten epidemic um, as a way to sort of highlight what's happening in our own backyard. And it's something that I like to do because I, I do most of my work domestically. And the reason I do that is because we still do have major problems when it comes to HIV and, of course, other public health issues in this country. But this, this graph is really nice because, again, uh, we're comparing or she's comparing <clears throat> here cities and subpopulations in the United States with uh, prevalence rates uh, for countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where a lot of our uh, research efforts uh, are, are going toward, uh, and rightfully so, don't, don't get me wrong. But you can see that depending on the subgroup, for example, black men in Washington, D.C., you have prevalence rates that uh, rival, if not surpass, places like Nigeria. When you look at men who have sex with men in New York City, you're getting to prevalence uh, rates that are beyond Kenya and um, rivaling or getting close to South Africa, places where we see generalized epidemics where um, we know that there's massive intervention needed to reduce the impact of the epidemic on the population. Um, this little map you can see is of New York City. Uh, that's where I do research. And another area that I think is important for us to remember um, has a very uh, 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 impactful epidemic, particularly impactful on um, MSM. But you can see in certain areas of New York City, like um, Lower Manhattan, where the West Village and Chelsea, sort of the gay ghettos are, but also areas where you have predominantly Afro-Caribbean and African-American populations, like Central Brooklyn, uh, a lot of uh, Dominican and Afro-Caribbean populations in the South Bronx where you have, again, these extremely high prevalence rates that almost uh, look like a generalized epidemic. So we still have a big problem uh, in this city, um, in this country, and these uh, statistics really help show that. Uh, what has been a really, I think, depressing message, uh, or not so much a message, but a, a, a depressive set of findings that uh, we've seen over the past decade have to do with uh, the HIV epidemic, particularly as it affects young uh, MSM of color and specifically young black MSM. So um, as you can see from these bullets, young MSM account for over a quarter of new infections between 2006 and 2009, which is the period that we have the most recent data for. And we saw a 48% increase among HIV uh, for black MSM 13 to 29 years old. That's the highest among all subgroups looked at, and again, this most recent incidence data that we have from CDC. Um, and what that incidence report that Prejean and colleagues published in 2011 showed us was that we really had a stable epidemic except for young MSM of color. That's where we saw increasing rates of infection. And it's not really an alarm call, you could say, because the alarm's been going off for years now, and that's what uh, we don't always remember. Um, there has been a little bit more increased focus on understanding what's happening for uh, black people in the United States when it comes to HIV and even um, some focus even on uh, MSM of color. But we know from seroprevalence data dating back to 2001 that uh, young black MSM have been disproportionately impacted by HIV. So it really, to me, has been um, a, 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 a heat to action. Uh, that really requires us to, to start to do um, more dedicated focus interventions to help reduce the impact of HIV on uh, young black MSM. So I, I won't continue to just harp on this, but you can see again uh, from 2001 to 2005, uh, looking at age 13 to 24, young men who have sex with men, the black Hispanic group, has a extremely uh, well, a high rate of increase relative to the other groups. And then going to our most recent data that we have, or the most recent period we have data for 2006 to 2009, again, um, increasing. So this, the story has been consistent uh, over these last uh, several years. Why are these disparities taking place? Why are uh, young MSM of color 
uh, more impacted by HIV than uh, other groups, it must be because they have more unprotected sex. Um, that's, you know, the simple explanation, but it's also the incorrect explanation. And I'm sure some of you, if you're interested in this uh, uh, population or um, HIV and domestically, you may have heard of a guy named Greg Millette. He's done a lot of meta-analyses, and he's focused a lot of that work on um, understanding the disparities among MSM when it comes to HIV infection. Um, and I had the, the privilege to work with him on a meta-analysis meta that we published last year, right uh, in, in uh, sort of at the time of the International AIDS Conference, which many of you know was held here in the United States for the first time in many, many years um, uh, in Washington, D.C. And in this meta-analysis, he really confirms what he's been finding um, for years doing these types of, uh, of, of, of analyses, uh, which is that it's not about uh, sexual risk behavior, it's not about unprotected sex, it's about other factors that um, shape and, and, and sort of create enhanced vulnerability for black men who have sex with men. So I realize this is a really tiny, difficult to read table, so I'm gonna just try to briefly um, show you a little bit of, of what, he's, what he uh, did here. So we, he has a, a set of different factors <coughs> that he looked at and wanted to look at the odds of, uh, or the probability that uh, this impacted uh, black men who have sex with men more than um, other uh, men who have sex with men, I, uh, comparing really white MSM. And what I've highlighted here are the factors that <clears throat> have an odds ratio above one, uh, that there was an, a significant difference. And you can see the, the top risk factor for black MSM was having black partners. Um, it's sort of weird to say having uh, a same race partner as a risk factor, but when you have such a high prevalence, uh, the risk becomes greater, of course, if you're having partners where the, uh, the, who come from a pool where there's a greater likelihood of, of being infected. Um, having a current STI diagnosis, uh, another important risk factor, we know that um, if you have an STI, particularly an undiagnosed STI that's not treated, um, you're, high, you're much more susceptible to not only transmitting HIV if you're HIV positive, but um, receiving HIV um, if you're negative. Um, undiagnosed HIV, uh, another big issue for black MSM. Uh, something that I think gets more at structural issues, uh, or you could say individual level factors, but I like to think of it more in a structural perspective, and that's low education. Um, Things like CD4 counts that are low, low income, uh, crack cocaine use, all of these factors, you know, are about, uh, I think, they tell a, a really complex story that goes from things like individual level behaviors and factors to more structural conditions like access to care, like uh, poverty, um, et cetera. So there is a, uh, not an easy story to, to tell when it comes to why black MSM are more likely to uh, become HIV positive than other groups. But we know it's not all about just their individual level risk. Um, I won't go into as great a detail, but again, this is uh, uh, us looking at um, differences among HIV positive versus other, um, uh, or HIV positive black MSM versus uh, HIV positive MSM of other races and ethnicities, and you can see where the differences are, are in disclosure. Um, that has a lot to do with stigma, another uh, really important issue that has to be addressed in this population. Access to HIV care, um, substance use, in this case, it's primarily crack cocaine, uh, and also the structural barriers of income and education. So um, I hope you get a good idea now of uh, that there is a problem, first of all, and that the sort of reasons behind the problem are complicated. Uh, they're not necessarily all related to individual level behaviors and risk factors. It's um, a lot of different things going on that are shaping uh, risk. And I was really interested, um, largely because of work that I did uh, with Nate um, and uh, Kathy Sykema, who used to be here um, and our colleagues uh, focused on uh, 
traumatic uh, experiences, particularly childhood sexual abuse among people living with HIV. I really got an interest in trauma and what I really like to call more generally chaotic life experiences. Um, I'm not necessarily looking at PTSD diagnoses in terms of uh, how I uh, operationalize what a traumatic experience may be, uh, but it is more about conditions that are particularly stressful and how that shapes uh, different outcomes for MSM of color. So uh, traumatic life experiences and vulnerability for uh, MSM. MSM, particularly urban uh, men who have sex with men, contend with uh, co-occurring problems that can be described uh, as a syndemic. This is another conceptual framework that I, I really like uh, that uh, you know, really evolved out of work uh, originally done by, I know, a, a, a very good friend of Sierra and collaborator, Meryl Singer. Um, and I think it's a really nice way to think about how multiple epidemics shape outcomes. So um, Meryl Singer, well, I'll get to him in a second, but uh, in thinking about the, the sort of multiple epidemics that shape health outcomes for young black MSM, there's data that suggests, and most of this is qualitative data, that uh, black MSM are subject to numerous traumatic life experiences that can enhance vulnerability to HIV. That includes things like childhood sexual abuse, uh, but also exposure to, to truly abject poverty, uh, not just uh, you know, living in uh, low-income housing, but not necessarily having uh, a place to, have, to get food, not necessarily knowing that you're gonna have shelter, homelessness, uh, a big factor as well as incarcerations and experiences with juvenile justice system. So I use this idea of syndemic as, as a framework um, because it does sort of help us understand how uh, both social and physiological epidemics cluster together. Um, and uh, you can have things like chronic infectious diseases that uh, co-occur with racism and institutional poverty. Uh, so an epidemic isn't just about uh, a health outcome, but it really is about a health outcome by a certain person, place, and time. It really is contextualizing and integrating um, health and social conditions in a way that I think really works. So um, this is actually in that white box coming from Merrill Singer. He says, syndemics occur when health-related problems cluster by person, place, or time. The problems, along with the reasons for their clustering, define a syndemic and differentiate one from another, although they may have nested or overlapping relationships. To prevent a syndemic, one must not only prevent or control each disease, but also the forces that tie those diseases together. And that, I think, is, is a, a crux of, of his argument and a really important piece to think about, is it's not just about intervening upon the one uh, condition or one disease, but really thinking about those social forces that, that bind those conditions or diseases. So uh, with that, I was interested in thinking about um, various experiences that uh, young black MSM ex have and trying to understand sort of the, the additive impacts of those experiences on their um, health outcomes. And, to do this, I used uh, data from a study I conducted uh, between uh, really 2009 and 2011. We finished it early 2012. Um, that was called the Brothers Connect study, and it involved uh, three nested data collection strategies. Uh, the first was a cross-sectional survey that we did. Uh, the goal was 250, but we got to 227, um, 225 and young black MSM, and that focused on uh, demographic, psychosocial, and family peer group information. We got experience in, or uh, information on sexual behavior, substance use behaviors, and also these sort of what I was calling distal risk factors like ex uh, exposure to poverty, to substance use, uh, discrimination, other forms of trauma, uh, and also to look at resiliency factors, which I'll get to um, in a little bit. The uh, other two data collection strategies, which I'm not going to get into um, at this time, uh, were a longitudinal sex diary that uh, 150 participants who did the uh, cross-sectional survey completed. And that was a diary that was conducted over eight weeks. It was a weekly diary. It's a, basically a survey. I call it a diary 
but it's not, you know, sort of the, the qualitative dear diary, I had a great day today. Um, it's more about uh, doing a, a regular survey that um, assesses sort of your feelings at a given moment. Um, and here we did a, a diary that asked participants to uh, record how they were feeling, um, but also to record their uh, instances of having sexual behavior and then to tell us details about uh, one of those episodes in the prior week. Um, we next then uh, did in-depth interviews with a subsample of 30 participants who had done both the cross-sectional survey and the sex diary. And we're still in the process of analyzing the qualitative data. Um, I started to look at our longitudinal sex diary data and I would love to be able to talk to you guys about that next time if you want to bring me back. Um, so the sample is a convenient sample, uh, very much a community-based sample. We aim to be as uh, diverse as possible in our recruitment venues, but you can see a good third of the sample did come from a sort of snowballing or participant referrals. We, uh, we had a maximum of two referrals per participant, uh, but it was an important strategy for us to get to our numbers. We actually had a very short period of time in which we had to do this study. We had one year uh, because of lots of delays from CDC um, in terms of allowing us to get, our, 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 our get started. We also did uh, outreach uh, at community-based organizations and clubs uh, where about a quarter of our sample came from. And then also online venues like Black Gay Chat, which is a popular um, online hookup website, um, as well as Facebook and other um, related sort of social media websites. And then, of course, just through flyering. So again, I apologize uh, for the slightly tiny text here. But these are the characteristics of the sample. It's, um, not the biggest of samples, but for this population, there haven't been that many studies um, where you've gotten a good number, uh, like more than 200 of uh, young black MSN, unless you're talking about a, a large-scale CDC-funded uh, study. So I was really proud of, actu of being able to get these numbers. Um, it's a racial, or I should say ethnically diverse sample. Um, all of our participants identified essentially as black, but you could see while most were, or 61% African American or black, we also had a sort of uh, black Hispanic or uh, Afro-Caribbean participants that were 28% and 7%, and then also mixed race participants. Um, for education, we have this paradox that I see in a lot of my samples actually, and not just my samples, but the samples of my colleagues in New York, where you see a re relatively high levels of education, but uh, but also low income levels. So there's this disparity of education and income. And we have that in this sample as well, as well with um, you know, almost two thirds of the sample having at least some college, but most, uh, you know, 74% having an income of 25,000 a year, or sorry, 20,000 a year or less. And a lot of that has to do with that a quarter of these students, or, or a quarter of these uh, participants were students. Uh, but also you can see 35% were unemployed. Uh, of course, we are uh, in a uh, hopefully a upswing in our economy, but uh, things are still hard, and they certainly were between 2009 and 2011. Um, so some of this is a function of just uh, where we are in, in, in terms of the, the economy and the city and in the, in the country. Um, <clears throat> you can see sort of their insurance status. Um, uh, most of these participants, uh, most of these guys had tested for HIV, 83% out of the, those who were HIV negative had tested for HIV in the last six months. Um, about a quarter were HIV positive, um, which is, uh, you know, not surprising at all given, you know, the, the epidemiology that we just saw. Um, uh, uh, also 75% identified as gay, whereas 26% bisexual. We also asked, uh, just really out of curiosity, how they would label themselves with these other sort of designations of including same gender loving, two spirited, queer, homo thug, and on the down low. And you can see that um, same gender loving was most popularly endorsed, but the other categories were also um, endorsed. Uh, most were single. Uh, a good proportion, 60 or 59 percent, had had unprotected anal intercourse or UAI in the past two months. 13 percent reported serodiscordant UAI. Uh, and uh, for drug use, uh, the majority reported some drug use, uh, most of that being marijuana. Uh, 
but we also had about 30% who reported a stimulant use, uh, either coke, crack, or uh, methamphetamine. So for this sort of part of the, 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 the project, I wanted to understand, well, first, traumatic life experiences among young black MSM, and then uh, get a, a, a sort of, a, to be able to explore the relationship of those experiences to risk factors, including unprotected intercourse, substance use, and depression. And what I really was interested in is, is actually replicating some of the work of a, a colleague and friend of mine, Ron Stahl, who looked at uh, additive effects of, of sort of traumatic life experiences on HIV vulnerability for a large sample of, of multi-ethnic MSM. And he was using also this sort of syndemics framework to uh, uh, sort of think through his, uh, his findings. So uh, first you can see here, these are uh, just um, odds ratios looking at uh, the relationship between our sort of five categories of traumatic life experiences physical abuse, sexual abuse, sex work, homelessness, and incarcerations with um, the outcomes that I was most interested in, unprotected anal intercourse uh, and serodiscordant, uh, or UAI, as well as uh, CAGE, uh, which is a measure of alcohol abuse, uh, drug use and stimulant use, and then also major depression, which we looked at using the K10, which is a, a very popularly used measure. And you can see, I, I won't go through everything, but you can see um, that their relationships uh, across the different traumatic life experience variables and um, HIV risk factors. Uh, for those who experience physical abuse, you can see uh, a greater likelihood of having UAI, of a greater likelihood of uh, alcohol abuse, stimulant use, uh, as well as major depression. Uh, for sexual abuse, Primarily, UAI was where uh, the main finding was. And I should say, these are uh, at the P.10 uh, level of significance. This is why you are seeing, um, for some of the confidence intervals, one uh, is included, like for this one. Uh, so this is not all um, you know, robust significance. But I like to use confidence intervals as opposed to p-values just to give you a better idea of like what's actually happening here. And you again, you see some relationships here. Um, bigger ones with sex work and stimulant use. Um, uh, for homelessness, we see uh, relationships with discordant UAI, uh, drug use, uh, and so on. So a constellation of relationships here, but the pattern, I think, so shows some kind of, you could almost say, convergent validity in the sense that each of these, again, traumatic life experiences is related to um, some type of vulnerability or risk outcome. So when it came to looking at the number of, of, uh, of traumatic events or life experiences experienced, uh, more than a quarter of the sample, 27% not experienced none. So didn't experience any physical abuse, sexual abuse, homelessness, incarcerations, or sex work. Uh, but uh, about 20% uh, or a fifth had experienced one, another 20% or 21% really experienced two, and uh, almost a third had experienced three or more of those uh, traumatic life experiences. And so when I looked at just sort of the raw means, or these are uh, frequencies for uh, uh, the different outcomes, you did start to see somewhat of a linear effect here, such that uh, you can see for those with no traumatic life experiences, you had about 39% reporting UAI in the past two months. With one, it jumped to 59%, two, 66%, three, 68%. Uh, when I did generalized linear models uh, that sort of helped me see how these odds change uh, with uh, increasing traumatic life experiences, you can see when setting, you know, no, none as our, our, our basically a comparison, so no odds, um, relative to having no odds or to having no traumatic life experience, you have about a 2.21 uh, increased odds if you have one moving up to 3.29, two, and then we see a little dip, but it's really about the same as um, the, the two there, which uh, is, as this red line shows, it's a pretty strong linear trend that you're seeing there as you see increasing traumatic life experiences 
you see increasing odds for unprotected anal intercourse. Um, we didn't have as much uh, uh, variation in uh, serodiscordant UAI because most of our participants, participants had not had um, discordant UAI, but you still see this uh, linear, although it's, when you look at those odds ratios, it does seem you know, like you have a, a more like a quadratic happening there. But um, you can see that, again, increased odds as um, exposures go up uh, with having two exposures being uh, quite uh, high relative to the others. However, this, oops, sorry, uh, was just marginally significant, this, this finding, uh, in terms of the, the generalized linear model. We'll look at stimulant use or use of cocaine, crack, or methamphetamine. Again, the, the raw frequencies show somewhat of a linear trend. And then when you look at those odds ratios um, with increasing uh, exposures, again, you have this, this pretty strong impact uh, of uh, traumatic life experiences on stimulant use. And then finally, um, I don't have the, the fancy line graph because these are the actual estimated marginal means from that generalized linear model, which show uh, it doesn't you know, look maybe as striking as the odds ratios, but this is sorry, the strongest effect uh, that I see when you look at these, this, this, these increasing exposures. The, the impact on the uh, depression measure using the K10 is, is pretty strong with none having about a score of 14 to going up to about a score of 21 uh, for those with uh, three exposures. So what we saw was that there was this additive effect of uh, trauma experiences on HIV risk factors um, and that really showed us that increasing numbers of uh, tr these exposures to traumatic life events increased the odds of uh, engaging in unprotected sex, increased uh, the odds of substance use, as well as um, increased uh, depression. But there does seem like there could be somewhat of a ceiling effect that once you have perhaps more than two exposures, you uh, may not see as much uh, increase uh, the more you have. And Ron Stahl, who again I modeled some of this, or whose paper I, I used um, as a framework to model some of these analyses, uh, found a, a very similar ceiling effect in his work. So what does this tell us? That young black MSM are negatively impacted by multiple forms of trauma, um, and that these experiences are not limited to just, uh, and I shouldn't say just, uh, because childhood sexual abuse is by itself, it's a very impactful and uh, negative event, but also homelessness, physical abuse and violence, and incarcerations are also really critical um, risk factors uh, uh, that increase vulnerability in this population. And it does appear that there may be physiological and sociological epidemics interacting to increase vulnerability, or that there is this endemic of poverty, of abuse and incarcerations that is going on. So if we really want to engage in, in, in interventions and prevention work that's going to be high impact as is a catchphrase as well as this idea of combination prevention. We have to also think about sociocultural and structural factors, not just uh, individual level factors, not just treatment, um, but also dealing with poverty, thinking about sexual silence and, st and structural violence and how those impact um, vulnerability. So I'm not done quite yet, but I will be very soon because I, I want to make sure I, I hear your questions. In fact, I'm really interested in your questions and your input on what I'm going to present uh, very briefly now, which is um, some work that I have really just done. It's, it's very preliminary. You're going to be able to tell because I haven't done fancy graphs yet. Um, but that I um, am hoping will get some traction and be able to help move um, uh, some, uh, some of the findings around resilience uh, out of uh, sort of the, the, the exploration stage and more uh, into something that I can write up and publish. So I was interested in understanding not just risk and vulnerability, but also resilience. And when I've had those findings, um, looking at the uh, additive impact of traumatic life experiences, they were really disheartening to me, and I was looking for moderators. I was really like, I mean, you're not supposed to go searching in your data. Um, I, these actually were 
driven by hypotheses that I had a priori, but I was looking for what were the buffers, what were things that might uh, moderate the impact of trauma experiences on vulnerability and risk. And I wasn't really finding it in the assortment of uh, different resilience factors that I had uh, uh, operationalized and collected data on in this, in, this, in this study. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but one thing I, I didn't do is start to sort of think about resilience um, less as a unidimensional construct and more as something perhaps multidimensional. So resilience has really uh, garnered attention uh, in the past uh, few years as a, a key focus area for interventions, particularly those that are um, uh, uh, being designed and implemented to reduce uh, HIV and poor mental health outcomes among men who have sex with men. And um, Amy Herrick and Ron Stahl wrote a paper, uh, again, sort of connecting syndemics and resilience, talking about um, addressing sort of psychosocial health conditions, but as well as promoting a resilience framework uh, for thinking about how to uh, best improve outcomes in the population. So they and many others have started to think that promoting resilience may be the way to actually reducing um, HIV and pr improving health uh, among MSM and reducing the negative impact of, of these trauma exposures. So, uh, you know, taking a strength space as opposed to a deficit based approach uh, is, again, being called for and advocated for. But one thing that um, I've been curious about, and I know many uh, others, is well, how do you actually operationalize resilience? It, it actually is not one of those very easy, easily defined concepts because it can be made up of so many different things. And um, just alone for me and, and my conceptualization of it, I think of self-efficacy and empowerment. I think of coping skills um, and things like social support. And those are some of the constructs that I measured in the Brothers Connect study. So uh, as sort of you know, some exploratory aims that uh, have guided this, this, these next analyses I did, I was really trying to understand, well, what are maybe profiles of resilience as opposed to just looking at coping or just looking at self-efficacy, let's start looking at them together and, and see how they, uh, uh, how they group together or what types of sort of patterns or profiles we might see in this sample of 227 that I have. And I was also interested in looking at some of the relationships of those profiles to mental health outcomes. So again, these are my, my more crude graphs because these are more exploratory um, analyses. But I wanted you to see the, the main concepts that I'm looking at here are um, parental social support, peer social support, um, a measure of mastery, which is a, a, a conceptualization of self-efficacy. Um, uh, it's a measure that was used by a, a collaborator and colleague of mine, Ilan Meyer, in his study of um, LGBT, well, LGB, lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals in New York City. And then this measures the Connor, David Res Connor Davidson Resiliency Scale. Um, it is a resilience measure, but it's really, um, uh, it operationalizes and conceptualizes resilience in a stress and coping framework. So I think of it as, a, 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 not, I won't say a proxy for stress and coping or adaptive coping, but it, it certainly has items that are much more amen about coping responses um, uh, than, than say sort of empowerment feelings or feelings of, of confidence. So I looked at those three measures. You can see there are some significant correlations, but they're all pretty much at the lower level. Um, and when I look at uh, just a, a, a normal cluster analysis, uh, a k-means cluster analysis, you see that you can, uh, the, the best sort of solution uh, for looking at those uh, variables was uh, this sort of floor cluster solution that um, gave me almost four equal groups you can see the percentages there. I'm going to try to get through these quickly because so I do have some time for your questions. But um, you can see one of our profiles I called sort of high peer support, low parental support. And just to give you a quick how to like think about these, this is the, the distribution. Uh, this is the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile. And this line represents the median for the entire sample. This represents where this particular cluster falls. So you can see that they fall 
a little bit above the median, but I'm calling that average because it really is sort of still within that 25 to 75 percent window of of what would be considered, you know, the bulk of the the distribution of scores for the entire sample. Where they're a little bit higher is uh, in peer uh, peer social support. They're about at the median for uh, the CDRS or the sort of coping proxy measure that I'm using, and they're a little bit lower on parental support. So this was about 28% of my sample. I've got another group that's more low peer and parental support, but they are at the, about the average levels for mastery and that CDRS measure or stress and coping measure, but you can see quite outside the bound for peer support and, and, and somewhat lower on the parental support. For the third one that I saw, you, these are the, the really, the guys are doing really great, you could almost say. These are ones that are above average mas mastery. They've got, you know, pretty strong peer support, above average resilience or stress and coping, and they've got way above average parental support. That's about 50, or that's about 25% of the sample or, or uh, 55 participants. And then the last profile is the ones, these are guys who are not doing so well. These are guys who have low self-efficacy, very low uh, relative to the rest of the sample, very low uh, stress coping uh, relative to the rest of the sample. Uh, about middle range for peer and parental support, but these are guys that are defined by the low mastery and, and uh, stress coping. And that, that's about 21% of my sample. So. What I did is look at those profiles uh, relative to uh, mental health outcomes using the BSI, the Brief Symptom Inventory, a very commonly used measure that gets at multiple domains of uh, mental health functioning. Here, I'm sorry, this is the K10. That's what I started with and I used the BSI. K10, you can see um, a, a pattern that's gonna be the same for a lot of my outcomes here. The guys that are my, my the group that's you know, high mastery, high stress coping, have the lowest, these low mastery, low um, uh, stress coping guys have the highest. When I look at somatization on the BSI, see a very similar pattern. These groups are not really differing that much. So even those, the, the low parental support but high peer support group, even the low peer support but low parental support group, they're, they're all, you know, they're doing a little worse, but they're not that bad relative to these guys. And remember, these groups are all, if, they're, if you wanted to find them as anything, they all have at least average levels of mastery and coping relative to these. Um, won't continue like specifics, but obsessive compulsive, same pattern. Anxiety, same pattern. Hostility, uh, again, another subscale of the BSI, same pattern. Psychoticism. Uh, same pattern. And what is really important here is when I compare those first three groups with the last groups, the, the effect sizes are, are uh, huge, like bigger than I've seen in anything that I've, for my own data uh, that I've collected. You know, 0.72 to 0.98 when I look at those mean differences for those lower um, resil or low, low mastery, low stress coping guys relative to the, all the other three that remember they did have, they differed on their support levels, whether they had low parental support or low peer support or both, but they had, you know, basically average levels, if not above, of mastery and, and stress and coping. And so one of the things that it seemed was going on here was that um, these outcomes seem most influenced by mental or, or the, the mastery or self-efficacy measures and coping skills and that that may be, um, what is most important for us to focus on in terms of these resilience factors. I just want to know that, um, and I, this is like my second to last slide here, but uh, there's a lot that I think we have to learn. There's a lot more to investigate when it comes to resilience, when it comes to how to best operationalize and conceptualize it. But one of the things that I, I think is really important, and, and I, I think is, is something that take us back to the first sort of set of findings I, I, I told you about is that there are still some issues in promoting resilience because we are focusing mostly on individual level phenomena when we think about resilience. It's mostly operationalized in individual level terms. Social support may be the one way of thinking of it outside of that framework, but 
one thing I think we have to be balanced about is not promoting resilience uh, at the cost of not you know, really doing the hard work of developing and implementing structural interventions that are going to change social conditions. And why is that so important? Because when I, and I, I didn't have a bullet for this, but when I started looking at those profiles as potential buffers, I didn't really see much happening. It, I saw a marginal um, effect for moderation when I looked at mental health outcomes, but not really for the HIV risk outcomes. And I, I, I have not done the type of analysis to, to tell you that it's those traumatic factors and these sort of social conditions or factors related to social conditions that are most impactful, but based on sort of my inability to look at or find sort of that buffering, I am thinking that these are still important and perhaps more important factors uh, to focus on in terms of future work and interventions. So I will leave it there. Um, I actually, well, I'll leave it here with some uh, campaigns and messages that uh, we've seen actually in New York City that I think get at one thing that's also undergirding a lot of this and I haven't talked about, but that's stigma and sort of a lack of acceptance for a lot of uh, black MSM. And so more campaigns like this, more focus on changing policies that uh, imp or worsen conditions and, and programs that improve conditions is, is really, I think, where we need to next go for, for this population. And just want to acknowledge that CDC funded this work and it wouldn't have happened without um, a, a number of, of research assistants and collaborators. So thank you very much.